I was looking at Jim Jackson's uh, career numbers. He, of course, NBA on TNT, also uh, a uh, Clippers analyst. He'll be broadcasting the Fort Worth region of the NCAA tournament tomorrow, March Madness games until the end of the month. And uh, he joins us on the program. I got you for a career high 50, Jim. You, 50. Yeah. 50. Yeah. 50. <laughs> what did 50 feel like? Uh, you know, fun, ironically, I was sick because we were in Denver. So the night before, I couldn't sleep. And plus, the altitude had me all stopped up. So I had to actually run my shower to get moisture in the room just so I could breathe. So the next day I shoot around, I just wasn't feeling it. Went to sleep. And, and then when the game started, uh, actually, I wasn't paying any attention. I was just I was just balling. Now, keep in mind, like right before that, a couple of weeks before, Jamal Mashburn had 50 points in Chicago at the United Center. So in that game I had it, it was uh, in Denver. It ended up going into overtime. But, um, again, I didn't shoot a lot of threes, though. So mine were more layups mid-range jump shots, free throws. I don't even think I had a three-pointer that game. But you look at what Kyrie did last night. He had 60 yeah. and still had seven and a half minutes to go. Why yep. not just leave him in there? Because it's not like fatigue because he may not play for a couple more games. And whoever comes in for Kyrie is going to be shooting shots. So if you're Kyrie, if you're Steve Nash, you say, mm-hmm. stay out there. Let's see what you can do. No, no. Un- unwritten rule because they were up big. So it was no need for Kyrie to but be But wait, wait. If I mean, Patty probably, Mills comes in, what? Jim, then Patty Mills right. is going to be taking those shots instead of Kyrie. Yeah, but but Pat, but Patty Mills doesn't have 60. You see what I'm saying? I mean, now, oh. as, as crazy as it sounds, okay. it's just one of those things that coaches have respect for other coaches. I remember I was in high school. It was the same kind of thing where I had 50 and I still had about four or five minutes left in the game. The opposing coach used to work for my high school coach. And we were up big. I mean, we were up, we had 120, 30 points, something like that. The game was out of reach. So I got the record, but my coach said, you know, enough is enough because I have respect for the other team Mm. and the other coach. And I'm not, if somebody else comes in and knocks in some points, okay, that's fine. But it's not like you're kind of, kind of just digging your heel in a little bit more. Now, you'll see that when you know it's personal between two coaches, two organizations, two franchises, where they'll go for two when they don't really have to. They'll go for a touchdown uh, when they're up big anyway just to make a point. That's when it's personal. Well, Kobe was helped out because the Lakers were down big starting the third quarter against Toronto. And then he goes Mm -hmm. for 55 in the second half against the Raptors. Yeah, almost like, though, too, his last game. I was at the last game that he played. And about the third quarter, I was about to leave. Because, I, you know, me, I'm, I'm, I'm lazy. I like to try to beat traffic <laughs> to get out of Staples Center. But something told me to stay. And because it's his last game, Utah had found out that no matter what happened, they weren't going to be in a position from the playoff perspective where they wanted to be. So the game really didn't mean anything. So keeping Kobe in to score those points and do what he had to do, it was more monumental. It wasn't a sign of disrespect. They were actually playing homage to Kobe at this last, that was his last game, especially at the at the time Staples Center and in the league. So that's a whole different dynamic that I think everybody, the opposing team, Utah, Lakers, everybody bought into. Totally different. You know what I mean? Is 60 the new 50? Seems like it, doesn't it? But here's the thing, though, Dan. You know this. You got more possession. You're utilizing the three-point line a lot more. So you're going to get more shots up, okay? The way the game is being played today, and, and I get, you know, a lot of times, I grew up because in the 90s, the possessions were low. So you were scoring 70, 80 points, okay? Because each one was kind of grinded out. You had some teams that, you know, got up and down the court. But for the most part, you, you know, you played a half-court game. So you can't be surprised at the numbers you're putting up in regards to total team points. But individuals that score, but and I, and I caution people about this all the time, Dan. Whether you see it in football, baseball, hockey, basketball, professional, you're all trying to score more points. Okay, you want to hit more home runs. You want to score. You want to score more more goals. You want to throw more touchdowns. Why? Because the fans enjoy that. It's more exciting to see. We can't be locked into what the game used to be, because internationally has grown so much. It's a global game, and people want it so. 
as much as we love the 90s and early 2000s, this is the way the game is today. And these young men that are playing, that's all they know. So I can't fault them for that. Do you think we'll see somebody get 80 again? Oh, definitely. I think so. Pick, There's too pick, many possessions in the game. Pick one guy. Kevin Durant. I can see, I can see KD getting it. I just don't no know question. if he's greedy enough. You know what? You're right, but it depends on the situation, too. If he gets off to an early start, let's say, let's say he has 30 or 40 at halftime, and the game is in balance, and he keeps going back and forth, well, KD is going to go for it in regards to, one, wanting to win the game because he's just a basketball savant. He loves to play the game, and he wants to win. So I can see Kyrie getting close because Kyrie is just an assassin. He's just going to go for it. You know what I mean? He, he really is. Giannis, I'm not for sure yet because he can get 50, but because the three ball doesn't have the same effect, he's not going to be able to gobble up those points like a Kyrie or a, um, you know, Kevin Durant or even a step. How did the Nets incorporate Ben Simmons here by the end of the regular season to be formidable once they get into the postseason? Well, first of all, Ben is not on the court. Is, is his mind right? I don't care what you do physically, game plan wise, put him in a position. But if his mind is not right, ready to play, then it doesn't matter. And, and I think that's the most important part you got to address with Ben Simmons. Is he talented? Of course. I mean, not having a jump shot, all of that kind of stuff. We saw what he could do when he's really on top of his game, in particular when Embiid didn't play. Totally different player. Yeah. But with the mental issues that he, you know, he addressed, are you able to tap into that side where he's mentally able to, to really come back and play the game at a high level? Because if he is, it's easy to intricate, intricate him into the game because he's going to play the point guard position. He's going to rebound, pass, and play defense. He's going to have to score. So putting him into a lineup with KD, Kyrie on the road, it's just inserting a point guard that wants to be a pass first point guard, but it got to be mentally. He got to be mentally right first. Talking to Jim Jackson, NBA on TNT, Fox analyst, also an analyst for the Clippers. I'm surprised now, Jim, when I wake up and I saw what the Lakers did that they won. Like I, <laughs> I expect them to lose now. Yeah. Can you? Let's say AD nope. comes back. No. Can't just. Mm -hmm. You can't. <laughs> <laughs> Is the season I, I over for the Lakers? I'm not going to say it's over because the play-in game, if they're still you know, in the top 10, provides you an opportunity to do something. So you can never say it's over, especially when you have LeBron James. And if you have a healthy AD that comes back with enough games under his belt, depending on where you slot it, if you're 10 and you have to play seven, um, how that matchup works. Now, that matchup may be – I don't know. I think it may be – Minnesota right there in seventh right now, I think, which is a tough one for the Lakers. That's tough. Um, but it's not insurmountable. But I just think there's so much going on. And, and again, Dan, you, you've been around us enough to know this. Internally, what is being said? Yeah. We don't know that on the outside. And again, I think the Lakers have done a great job, outstanding job of keeping whatever is being said inside, which is hard to do in today's world. So you really don't know what the conversations are inside that locker room other than the speculations that everybody on the outside has. I think you were at Ohio State three years. Mm -hmm. How many tournament games did you play? Uh, my, let me see. So my freshman year, we got to the second round, 32. So that's two. My third, my second year, three, sweet 16, five, nine. Got a game that sticks out? Well, yeah. <laughs> well, two, really. Two. And, I'm, and I, I, congratulations on Michigan winning this year, too, by the way. Um, you don't mean that. that. Some, you don't mean you know, that. No, I do. Actually, you know, you know, Dan, I do. I'm going to tell you why. Parity, bro. Because in order for that, for that rivalry to have some substance and meat, it has to be competitive. It wasn't competitive. I'm an Ohio State guy. Don't get me wrong. And I love to win it. But in order to have drama, okay. the other side has to win. And it's great for the Big Ten. So that leads me into the Elite Eight game that we lost to Michigan at Bad Five. 
And the reason why is because we beat them twice during the year and we were the number one seed in the Midwest. And that hurt from the simple fact that, you know, it was we had an opportunity to get to the final four. Now, you know how tough it is to beat a team three times in a row, and particularly a young team like Michigan that had nothing to lose. The other game that stands out to me is the year before in the Sweet 16 up in Detroit, we lost to St. John's. We lost pretty bad. They were more, we were physical. They were physical. We thought we had the team that really could get to a national championship. But unfortunately, you know, it, it just was a bad matchup for us. So those, those two games stand out to me. Who talked the most trash on that Michigan team in that tournament game, too? Jalen. <laughs> and Jalen's my guy. And, and here's the thing. Jalen, Chris, Jawan, Jimmy, and Ray are all great friends. I played with I played with Jawan in Houston, played with Chris in Sacramento. Jalen and I used to work out a lot in LA. Jimmy King uh, was in, in camp with us in the Mavericks. And I and during AAU season when my son was playing and every time you see Ray Jackson all the time. So those guys to me were at the time a rival. You know, they became adversaries, but they became friends. Okay. And but Jalen. Oh, it wasn't no question, bro. It, it, anybody, Juwan was quiet. Chris would get hyped. Jimmy would say some stuff, but it was always Jalen always talking. No, you, no doubt. Did you recruit Chris Weber to Ohio State? No. Nah. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, no, no chance. I pretty much with Perry Watts, with Perry Watson at, at at Michigan, it was pretty much kind of knew that uh, Chris was probably going to stay either Michigan State with Izzo and them, but. Uh, I knew he wasn't going to Duke because he wasn't the Duke. He didn't have it in, in his mind. But um, I knew with Perry watching at Michigan, that was almost like a no-brainer. Tom Tom Izzo said he cried when he lost Chris Weber. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, yeah. I mean, that's it. That's he's a game changer in regards to college at that time because he's such a hybrid player. I always thought that Juwan Howard's a little bit more skilled, okay, mm. at the time polished yeah chris was still raw and his talent was just off the off the charts and what he was in he brought a certain energy to his team and to the game itself and that's what separated chris at the time to be six nine six ten to handle it to, and especially this the iq to be able to make plays and pass now the iq may have hurt him a little bit with the timeout of not paying attention to what was going on or what happened don't get me wrong but I mean, and, and and that's a flaw that he had. But up here, and, and understanding when I played with him in Sacramento, unbelievable. Off the charts, bro. Did you play against Duke? Oh, I wish I would have. Now, if we were to beat Michigan, we would have played Cincinnati. And ultimately, if we would have been Cincinnati, we would have played. Um, but no. Did, did you hate played, Duke? It would have been North Carolina. Did you hate well, Duke? Well, I had a – no, no. Here's the thing. I had a beef with with Coach K because I got I got an ego. So my going into my sophomore year, the Goodwill Games were being put together. So I go try out, and um, I'm playing. I'm playing well. Um, I get down to the final cut, and I'm in my room, and you get that early call in the morning, bro. It's like come see Coach. I'm like, oh, what? Get in there, and they cut me. So they kept Brian stiff at the time, ACC, and Brian was good in college. But to me, I'm like, man, he's not better than me. I played better. And I held a grudge because that was the first time I ever got cut. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I didn't care too much. For are you over it, Jim? Jim, are you over getting no. cut? <laughs> can, can you, can't you tell? Can't you tell? <laughs> Hold on. And we, and we had a game. We had a, had a game at uh, Duke John's uh, in the garden a few years back. And I pulled Coach K to the side. I said, you know, I still got a little beef with you. <laughs> just, just because of, I, I mean, I never got cut. So to me, that was like, I'm going back and I'm going back to my room and I'm, I'm like, I just got cut. I'm not, now it fueled me. It gave me a different perspective on the game itself. Um, which energized me that whole summer and the next year. But I looked at the Duke. Now, I have much respect for what they've done. I mean, Christian Layton is probably one of the greatest college players to ever play the game. Bobby Hurley, Brad Hill, you can't take that away. But, yeah, I, I carried a little 
<laughs> it hurt a little bit right there. <laughs> it's always great to catch up with you. Have fun during the tournament. We'll be uh, we'll be listening. All right, brother. Appreciate you, man. That's uh, Jim Jackson, NBA on TNT, Clippers, Fox analyst.